Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our class about called Gardening for Newcomers. Thanks for coming out. My name is Doug. And what we're going to talk about today is, um, well, I should say that the premise of the class is that most of us have probably learned to garden somewhere else. And <clears throat> gardening here is different. And what we try to do is is just talk about what's different about it so that you can be prepared for that when you when you start to garden rather than going through a, a lot of trial and error. So we're going to talk about um, the weather, the altitude, um, the humidity in rain or lack of, um, soil, uh, the fluctuating seasons, the fluctuation of cold weather and warm weather uh, all on the same day, um, animals that can come in and uh, eat what you're growing in your yard. All these things we're going to talk about. I'll go over them. We'll do a little show and tell. I brought some plants that I think you might like. I like them. And we'll also work um, and, and try and answer your questions. So we don't have a really big crowd today. So we'll have time for questions and answers. So, um, <clears throat> And we also have, um, we, we have an online audience, we believe. They usually send in questions and Ken uh, brings those to our attention. So that's why we have the speaker and, uh, and the camera so that we can record the class. And some people would prefer to stay at home and maybe watch the class on Facebook, but I'm glad you're here. They're here as well. Probably so down at the square while watching it while we're waiting for it to rain. Yeah. <laughs> This is much more interesting than the parade, don't you think? I mean, you know, the parade is okay, but um, anyway, let's just talk a little bit about climates. As you know, we have four seasons here. So that means that in the wintertime, um, a lot of these annuals, and that's what we have up here in this nursery, they're annuals, they're going to die. They're just good for one season. So that's flowers and some of the vegetables that you see here. However, most everything else that we have here are perennials. That means they're gonna come back every season. They may go dormant and kind of disappear in the winter, but they'll come back next spring. So that means shrubs, trees, all the fruit trees that we have over there, um, they like the cold weather. They want it to get cold in the winter time and that's good for them. So fruit trees that we have for fruits that do well include apples, pears, cherries, plums, peaches especially, apricots. My neighbor has a couple apricot trees that are absolutely overwhelmed with fruit. Um, they're so big that she was unable to, th to thin the branches. So some of the branches are hanging down. So I've gone over there and picked apricots. So, um, but a lot of them have dropped on the ground. And so guess what? The other night it rained and all of a sudden there were like 15 javelina in my backyard. So if you haven't seen javelina, once they come to visit you, it's usually the whole family. There's a bunch of babies. There's a bunch of young adults. There's a big mom and dad. And one of them the other night <clears throat> was actually leaning against my back door, a slider. And it was leaning against it as if it were like the family dog just hanging out there. And so, uh, hmm? No, I didn't, I didn't, I, I said, I'm not opening the door. I'm not going to try and chase it away because I yelled at them and they just ignored me. But they didn't eat anything in my yard because they were all over there eating the apricots on the ground. And the way you can tell that they're there usually is you can hear them. They're really loud eaters and crunching those pits. They didn't spit out the pits like we might, you know, they crunch them all. So you can hear them a long ways away. Um, I used to have a dog that would smell them when they came in the yard. This was usually about three in the morning and she would go into a frenzy. So we'd have to wake up and look down there and yeah, there they are. Uh, but we have entire classes on animals uh, and how to keep them out of your yard. And believe me, animals can eat everything in your yard unless you've fenced everything in or picked out the right plants that they might not like. We'll talk about that as well. Fortunately, They've kind of ignored most of my plants, even though they kind of stumble on through and sometimes make a mess. But because I picked out uh, 
herbal plants, that is lavender, rosemary, sage, and some of these here that they tend not to like, they sort of ignore it. And I think that sometimes with animals, you know, if you can't completely fence them out, what you have to do is find things they don't like and hope you can kind of discourage them and send them on to your neighbor's yard. See what's over there, leave my yard alone. Um, but in spite of that, I had to grow, I had to build uh, a wrought iron fence around my vegetable garden because they definitely will come in there in the dirt to kind of clean it up a little bit. And so between her noise and the baby's crying, and then next door, my neighbors who have a bird feeder, which is really a javelina feeder, right? Because they will bang against the frame so the seed comes falling down and they crunch on the seeds because that's when I can start begin to hear them. And then they decide to hop up to my yard and see if there's anything better like the main course. Fortunately, they've eaten things that they like and I've replanted with things that they don't like. But believe me, they are, they can be everywhere. And I told a friend here that we had 13, 15 or whatever. She said, oh, that's nothing. We have 20 at a time in our yard. When they, they pass on through and they're, you know, kind of, they, they travel together, basically. You see the little babies. And so, and my son has just moved here. And so I called him and said, look at this animal against, right against the window there. Like it's just sort of, a dog hanging out on the back porch. I thought, you know, that's, to me, that's a little too familiar. I, I, I don't want them in my yard, but what are you gonna do, right? I can't sleep on a porch with a BB gun. It's against the law to shoot them and so on. You know, so you gotta learn to live with them. This is a big thing. And, you know, we'll have, have whole classes on how to deal with animals. And it isn't just javelina. There's deer, there's gophers, rabbits, and they're almost always hungry. And people, you see people post these online pictures of babies and how adorable they are. Well, they're adorable until they come and eat your yard. Then you don't think they're quite so adorable. To me, then they're hungry and destructive. So anyway, animals, a big consideration. And before you start contemplating what to plant, uh, it's important to get an idea of what animals you might have. Some neighborhoods have more deer than javelina. And we have <clears throat> lists of uh, on our website under garden talk there's a list of plants that deer don't like most of the time same thing with javelina and i think what we're going to do is if you're interested in receiving an email with links to some of the things and ken will take care of that for you there will be a link to the javelina resistant plants and the deer resistant plants so and this is different if you get the regular email uh, constant contact this is just for people that are here in the class and so you can, and Ken will probably have some other links for you as well in a, a summary of the class. So animals, animals are a big challenge. There are really more of them than there are people in Arizona, I believe. And after all, we're surrounded by a national forest. So there's lots of animals to contend with. So let's talk a little bit about um, climate. Now, as you know, we finally reached the end of the month of June, which in a way is almost the the toughest month of the year for plants. It is hot, dry, and windy, low humidity, practically no rain. We're finally in July, it's finally started raining again. So that your summer vegetables, like these tomatoes over here, um, they like the fact that, that we finally have a little bit of humidity, a little bit of rain. And so things, if, if um, we get more rain, plants will sort of come back to life uh, and, and and so that you can expect things to be a little bit better for a while. It's a good time to plant because the ground is a little bit softer and it's wet. 
and we're beyond, we hope, that hot, dry, windy period in June, which we usually tell people, if you can just get your plants to hang on, hang on through the much of June, when July comes along, we'll have a bit of a reprieve and things should get better. So climates. So <clears throat> when we think about planting in the spring, particularly these summer vegetables over here, you don't really want to plant until maybe near the end of May. We always say, you know, after Mother's Day, do not plant anything that's a annual until after Mother's Day. So that's usually late May because we can get a cold snap and basically everything can die or we can just sort of go into neutral and do nothing and you'll never have any vegetables. So <clears throat> ideally, the vegetables, the summer vegetables, they want it to be 50 degrees at night. That's the low temperature. So in April and May, you know, we may have beautiful sunny days, but it's not 50 at night. We're not even close to that. And uh, a lot of people, we know we gardeners, we can we tend to be a little bit impatient sometimes. And so we want to plant. It's a beautiful day. I want to put the tomatoes in. And, you know, we kind of caution people, be careful. Can you protect them? Oh, yeah, 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 it's fine, right? Two weeks later, they come back. Oh, my tomatoes died. They're pushing the cart. I never say I told you so. I give them the warning in the beginning. So you've got to be careful. You have a greenhouse, great. Nurse them along until the time is right. 50 degrees at night and late May. But, you know, given the humidity and the dampness in July and August, you can still have a really good season. Uh, tomatoes, peppers, squash, zucchini, string beans, those can all do well. I have all of those in my yard, my garden, and they're, they're coming along and doing pretty nicely. And they'll probably keep on going maybe even through October. So sometimes there really isn't a cold snap until maybe early November, and I'm talking about cold enough to kill the plants. By then, you hope that you've had your, your uh, summer harvest and things have gone well. Now, the other thing to remember is that we also have a good fall season for vegetables. And I'm just kind of talking about vegetables here. In late September, uh, we get a whole shipment of all the leafy greens. And you can plant those, and those include lettuce, spinach, chard, uh, bok choy, kale, um, broccoli, cauliflower. All of those can grow. Um, and they'll do well October, November, December. And then maybe in January, when it starts to get cold, they, they might, you know, finally die. You can try covering. Last winter, I covered my plants for a while with a cheesecloth, and that helped prolong their life a little bit. But I think the among the best plants that do nicely here are uh, lettuce. And you could pick, I mean, I think I had four or five different kinds of lettuce growing and they did well. And you can go out and, you know, pick a little bit of each one and, you know, pretty soon you have a nice salad. That's a, a good mix basically. So the temperature for those plants, the guide is if it looks like it's going to be below 35 at night, you may want to protect them. We usually do here in the fall as well. We watch the weather very carefully during the cold season. So you can cover up the veggies. Uh, this is the cold weather, you know, fall, winter vegetables. When it's going to be 35 or lower, cover them up with a cheesecloth, maybe uncover during the day. Some people think that's a little more than they'd ra rather have to do. But um, a couple nights of below freezing, and, and that may be the end of your season. But that might not be till almost January. So you've got, you know, pretty good... Um, growing season as far as vegetables. So let's talk a little bit about soil. <clears throat> now, most people come in here and they say, I think my soil is crummy. And I say, I think you're right. I think we all deal with that, right? So the soil in Arizona, it's crummy. It's either rocky or sandy or it's clay. Um, there's very little in the way of nutrients or really good soil. So some of us may have grown, grown up or lived in other parts of the country where the topsoil is really great in the Midwest. Um, that's not the case here. But what you, what you need to do is amend the soil. So we have mulch. So if you were to plant anything, um, we always tell you, the, tell everybody, you need a hole that's about two or three times as wide as the root ball. And blend in our, our mulch here, which is a composted material and it helps the plants get off to a good start. Throw out all the rocks and junkets that you come across in the ground and blend it so it's got a nice uh, area to, to grow up in. 
Um, so some of us who live up in the hills, you have sandy, rocky soil. Um, down in Prescott Valley, it can tend to be very heavy clay soil. Um, clay soil is really bad for drainage of the water. So, you know, you pour the water in there, you think you've got enough water, maybe you're putting in the exact right amount of water and it's not draining. And so the plants are not going to be happy. So here's a good example. Uh, my sister-in-law lives in Granville and she has a nice little backyard, some beautiful trees and shrubs doing really nicely. One spot was a problem spot. So I would keep going back there and bring her another shrub. Finally, I said, Sue, what's going on here? This is the third time we looked at a dead plant here. And so I took the plant out of the ground and the root ball was dripping wet. Okay, big problem, red flag right there. And I looked in the ground and there was this wall that was terracotta color. I mean, it was sticky, thick, consistent. There was water sitting there as if we'd, you know, as if it was like a watering hole. So that shows you that in a relatively small yard, you can have good soil and yet 10 feet away, you can have clay. And if you find that you've got a clay spot, it's really best uh, not to plant anything there. So really what I told Sue is don't plant anything here. Let's put that boulder over here. That's the best thing to grow here, except I couldn't move the boulder. It was too heavy. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, and you know, one way to ascertain whether this is a good spot to grow or not is to do the old fashioned perk test it's called. So you say you get a tree here and you're, you've got a wonderful spot picked out for it. We recommend that you dig a big hole and before you ever plant the tree, maybe even before you even get it, and then fill that up with water. And if it still has water in it the next day, don't plant there. That means there's inadequate drainage and it's just not going to work. Now we have uh, products that you can put in there to help. Uh, gypsum helps to break up clay. The compost that I talked about is good material. Um, you know, anything that's going to improve the drainage is helpful, but you may, um, you may struggle with that for a long time and may find that somewhere, even not that far away, um, the, um, the soil is okay. So uh, that perk test is always a good guy. And if you live anywhere in Prescott Valley, tend to be um, pretty heavy duty clay soil. I went to somebody's yard um, yesterday and they had a lot of uh, you know rock around the landscaping. You could see it was wet. The soil was not draining properly and they had all these pine trees and planted there and there was standing water around the little hole around the plant. And I said, you know, this is just, this is not a good situation. These trees do not like it. Nothing really likes to grow in water. Uh, so that's, so, th but you know, so we have these soil problems, but we have mulch, we have potting soil, we have manure, uh, lots that you, we can help to amend the soil. Yes, ma'am. So if you have like, for example, you live where you have a lot of, a lot of soil. So you take all the soil out, means a lot of soil, a lot of uh, clay. You take the soil out. What's the ratio that you say for um, the mulch to the soil? Is it one third to two thirds? Or four yes. Or Let me read it. I have to repeat your question so everybody can hear it, especially online. So the question is, when you're digging a hole, uh, what is the ratio of like mulch to soil? So if you have soil that's it's usually one part mulch, two parts native soil. So you still want to use that native soil after you've tossed out the rocks and any debris, or maybe your builder decided to leave trash there, you know, when they were building your house or whatever it is, you know, it should be soil so a plant can go but one part mulch, two parts native soil, because you don't want it to be all mulch and just be all just good soil, because after all, the plants kind of have to learn to exist in this soil that's not that good, but using the mulch helps it to get off to a good start. Um, so <clears throat> let's back to climate. Now, we talked a little bit about, you know, Mother's Day as far as the planting annuals, and usually that means the typical hundred year average or so is that the last frost occurs around the 19th of May. And then the first frost in the fall is usually near the end of October around the 29th. 
So during that period of time, you know, we have a season where you don't have to worry about annuals, you know, getting damaged in the cold. Now, <clears throat> we have a nice echo off the rocks and the walls here, and the firehouse is just over there. And so, uh, you know, a friend of mine used to live near a hospital. You call him on the phone, and the ambulances are just coming in all the time. It made it difficult to talk. But anyway, um, so within that parameter, just be aware of these frost dates. Now, all the trees that we have, shrubs and so on that are perennials, they have plenty of cold hardiness. They're, they're good to, you know, zero to 10 degrees. And so the planting season here is almost all year. Um, we don't usually plant when it's snowing or it's too difficult to work the ground. But from now until late fall is great because if we continue to get rain, the soil will be a little damp. It make, makes it easier to start digging. Um, you'll have moisture in the ground, which helps. And, um, and, you know, as long as you can get something in the ground, you're okay to plant. You don't have to wait till October. And whatever rules you might have had to abide by somewhere else, they don't necessarily apply here. So really, we can we can grow, you know, almost all year round, as long as you have a you know good sense of what plants are going to survive, what are shade plants, what are sun loving plants. We have them kind of divided down there: sun loving and shade. One of the things about you know you can go to a nursery anywhere and you'll see a plant that says "grow in full sun," which is okay a lot of the time, but whoever wrote that has never been here in the summer, late afternoon sun. You know what that's like, it's really intense. And so there are some plants that, and we put them in the shade section that people say, well, why is this the shade section? Because the tag says full sun, that's the reason. It may not be able. Let me give you some examples. I'm just gonna, just gonna talk about some of the plants. So this is um, a lantana. You've probably seen lantana and uh, you know different parts of the country and so on. But this is a perennial lantana. It's called Miss Huff Hardy Lantana. It'll make it through our winter, um, but it won't do too much, especially flowering, until the weather's hot, really hot. So I put one of these in my yard and it's doing really nicely. Then I put another one in a pot right by the garage on the south side of the house. This is about the hottest spot in the whole yard. This thing took off and just loves it. So um, this is a plant. If we have to, you know, sometimes you'll think people come in and say, my lantana died and maybe it's May. I say, well, wait a minute, just give it a little time. We haven't gotten any really hot weather yet, but once we do, this is what you'll get. Yes, ma'am. This is the one that gets quite large, right? It does get pretty large. It can get to be three feet tall and wide. So it's a perennial lantana. No, no, this is, we have another one that's called Miss Anne, and it's sort of a lighter yellow and purple flowers. This is more of the orange and red. Um, so only a couple lantanas. Let me show you a, an annual. This is called, this plant is called Miss Huff Hardy Lantana. <clears throat> so here's a perennial lantana. And they're all over this section here, this annual section. And if you gardened, like maybe in California, these will usually make it through the winter if there isn't a real cold snap. Um, but here, they're just, they're annuals. So they will die when it gets cold, as opposed to Miss Huff, and she'll just keep going. I mean, she'll be dormant. Miss Huff will be dormant in the winter, but come back in the spring. So it's, it's a little unusual to have plants that are both annuals and perennials, but we do have a couple. Let me show you another. This is called Vinca. This is an annual flowering Vinca. Now you may also know Vinca as a perennial ground cover known as periwinkle. The purple flowers and green leaves, it's quite a, quite a grower uh, it's perennial and will handle the weather, but this will, this won't, this will die back in the winter time. But right now they're doing nicely, and they don't need a whole lot of water, so it's a good choice for, you know, maybe 
in, in a pot on your patio or your deck. I've got one that's doing really nicely. Full sun, did you say? Yeah, full sun. Everything up here is full sun except one plant I'll show you. At least six hours a day of sunshine. And it could be a combination. The question was, what? Is, how do we define full sun? Full sun is defined as six hours per day of sunshine during the growing season. And it doesn't matter if it's three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. That's how we define full sun. So that means most of the plants here will do okay, except some of the shade plants. They need less than six hours per day. But I wanted to show you another annual. This is one of my favorites. This is called Portulaca. Where do you want me to hold it, Ken? Is it? Okay. Portulaca. So this is um, kind of a flowering succulent. Uh, I have one that is just growing like crazy. And I'm thinking about maybe I'll try and bring it inside during the winter. Now, some people experiment with this. Some have success. They'll bring the annuals indoors. Maybe they've got a spot in the garage where there's a window. Plants will need some sunlight in the winter. But a plant that might otherwise die in the winter, you could maybe nurse it along. I don't usually do that because I sort of feel like gardening is hard enough work already. So why not, you know, choose the plants that you think are going to survive? But what one of the things I like about this, in addition to these little succulent leaves, is these flowers kind of close up at night, right? And so I would come out at night, and all of a sudden I would think that one of my cats had eaten the flowers because they sort of do that. Uh, but then the next morning I would look out and the flowers were back, and I realized what was going on. And, that, and so I, I stopped yelling at my cat when he approached the plants because another time um, I saw him, he put his head into a plant and I thought, okay, here we go. He's going to start eating. And I was just waiting. And then all of a sudden he came back out and had a giant grasshopper in his mouth. So I said, all right, that's a good boy. You're, you're doing something to earn your keep in the household here. And, you know, he was so proud. He pranced around with this grasshopper. And he didn't, of course, I wanted him to just kill it right away. But, you know, the, how cats are, they got to, Pull the leg off. They got to play with it for a while, right? This, after all, this is their price. But yeah, uh -huh. and we have a bunch of them down there. If you like them, and they're yellow and orange. Um, I just like this rhodomite color, and I, I have one of these. I usually have about a dozen plants in pots on my deck for the summer, and I, you know, I'm accept the fact that they're only going to live through the summer. But if you treat them right and nurse them along, they're going to do really nicely. I noticed, by the way, as I was walking by them. There's actually a bunch of hanging baskets. You're talking about being able to bring it inside. To it yeah, out. yeah. So a hanging basket portulaca uh, might be okay in a warmer spot, perhaps. Some people, you know, have warmer spots closer to the house. This is for winter protection. Right now, I think they would do better with full sunshine, but this is this is one of my favorites. And will it come back, like, after the winter? Like, and do you just have to buy another one for summer? It won't come back. It won't. Well, not, no. That's it. Yeah, sometimes some of these, so the question was, will the portulaca come back? No, it's an annual. It may take a while for it to die. Some of these, you know, can last into late October or maybe early November. It sort of depends on the weather. But once we have freezing weather for several nights in a row, usually the annuals, that's pretty much the end of the season for them. So, but speaking of succulents and so on, uh, and I'm assuming most of us may be gardening somewhere else. We talked about that. When I first moved here, I brought a big jade plant um, because the movers wouldn't take it. So in the back of my car, I had my dog and my big jade plant, right? And so I, I you know, proudly, happily put this jade plant on my front porch because I'd had it for years. And this was like November. By December, the jade plant looked like sauteed onions. I mean, it just, this was before I started working here and learning about the climate and these are the things that we can do people you know proudly bring their uh, their citrus or their succulents or whatever it might be Bougainvillea. from yeah from bougainvillea beautiful they bring them from california not knowing that they won't survive the winter and then they're big dis they're you know disappointed so that's why we have this class and talk about those things so we can learn what's going to work bougainvillea citrus uh, succulents most of the plants in here, uh, you know, you might have been able to grow them somewhere else, but, but they won't survive here. It doesn't mean that there aren't lots of plants that will do just fine in the winter. Um, 
Here's another example. If you have a window mm -hmm. that, that goes out, can you plant some, bring some of those plants into that window? Yes. So the question is, <clears throat> can you put plants in a window that extends out beyond the house? As long as they get sunshine in the winter, windows are good places and you can try and get some idea uh, about how much sunlight they're getting. And some things, you know, may, may do really well. You just have to experiment with that. But it's, it's, a, good, it's a good option. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So the comment the question here was about this woman's experience. She brought plants in, put them in a wagon, put them in the garage, brought them back outside every day. That's a fair amount of work, you know, but some people are willing to do it. The drawback that she experienced is you get those annoying gnats like you get with house plants uh, because they lay their eggs in the ground and they all start coming out. So let me show you about something here. We have, uh, we'll talk about insecticides and so on. This is a product called Triple Action. And it's mostly neem oil. So that means you could spray this. This is a ready to use. You can just spritz it. You can spray your, even your indoor plants. You know, be careful, obviously, you don't want it all over the floor but you don't need to bring the hose in or anything like that. But this is one product that you can use to kill those annoying gnats that inevitably come out of the ground and they're in your house. I have them, I notice when I'm reading at night on my Kindle, one of them starts crossing the screen and I try and flick it off and it comes back. And then I flick it off and I'm flipping the pages. And this is very distracting. I'm trying to read a book here, you know. Um, but we have also, we have uh, down below, we have a granular product that you can sprinkle on and water in that will help with those. Some people use those little sticky uh, sheets, you know, that they'll, they'll get stuck on, uh, like the old fashioned way of catching flies and so on. So gnats can get caught on that. But that's, a, you know, one of the bugaboos here, and it often happens in indoor gardening, but this happened obviously with bringing something back and forth. But triple action, plus this is something that you can use on all your plants if you have roses, any flowering plants, chances are they're going to get uh, aphids, they're going to get thrips. And this is something where you can spritz them and it usually will take care of them. If it doesn't, we do have other products as well. The one caution about using this is because there's so much neem oil, you don't want to spray it on in the heat of the day in case that oil heats up in the sunshine. Um, so anyway, that was a good question about the gnats. I know they're really annoying. So we also have evergreen shrubs, such as this one, which is called Euonymus. And this is one of many in a big family. And we probably have, I don't know, four or five of them here. This is an evergreen shrub. This is pretty much what you get all year. So if you want something, you don't want to have to deal with it, but you, you don't want it to go dormant in the wintertime, because that's a consideration. I mean, a lot of things go dormant in the wintertime and our yards look kind of bare and empty and it's cold outside. You look out here outside and you look at one of these, you know, it gives you a little bit of color. I have one of these, I have this um, like in the corner of my yard and I can see it about a half a block away because the gold is so saturated, it stands out. And it's just there all the time. And it didn't do too much for the first couple of years. I think what was happening was the rabbit was like munching it. But it was nice enough not to eat the whole plant. And so it's finally kind of growing up getting to be a little bit bigger. But this is an easy to grow, low maintenance plant. It's not very woody. So if you if something, a branch gets too big, you can cut it back. So it's called euonymus. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have mature euonymus in my yard. And I noticed this morning that there's like brown on the top of the leaves. Mm -hmm. So brown on top of the leaves of euonymus. This time of year may be a little bit because of the heat. Okay. Um, this spring, when we had a couple nights when it was really cold, these turned brown and I remember cutting them back. The new growth is really vulnerable to extremes in weather. 
so it can be cold in the spring. It doesn't mean that the plant is dying. Well, after we had those cold spells, there were people who called in kind of in a panic saying, oh, my shrubs are dead. Oh, no, just don't worry, you know, don't, don't panic. Um, come in and we'll show you how to cut these back. And I cut a lot of them back, these and other shrubs. And within a week, the new growth was coming out. So in the springtime, new growth comes out uh, and then all of a sudden it gets cold. That's another challenge about gardening here is we think spring is here. It's 60 degrees. It's beautiful. Then whoops, all of a sudden it's 30 at night. So we have those big fluctuations in uh, nighttime and daytime weather, which can affect plants. And it's something we need to be aware of. I mean, if it was really bad, you could cover them up. During that time of year, we cover up plants that have flowers because we don't want the flowers to die. We want them to look nice when everybody comes in to look at them. The cold weather can like nip the bud, you know, before they really can do much of anything. But this one is year round color. And this is another thing to consider. Since we have a period of time when plants are dormant in the winter and there isn't a whole lot of color, it's nice to kind of select plants that are early bloomers to late bloomers so that you got something going on most of the year, something that's pretty, some color. Because if you have all of your color in May and June, then the rest of the year, it may not, you know, you'll be looking for more color and it may not be there depending on what you select. So when the plants bloom, is also an important consideration in planning your yard. Let's talk about roses. Anybody here like roses? I love roses. I have three roses in the front of my yard, right outside the front door, and they are my babies. I fuss over them, I deadhead them, you know, if something looks like it shouldn't, you know, unhealthy about it, I'm all over it, basically. And one of the things that uh, we should know about, we're really lucky here, that roses do really well in our climate. Um, and the this is one of the few advantages of having a low humidity is that they're a little less susceptible to some of the fungal diseases that, you know, maybe if you were growing your roses and Florida or Louisiana or someplace where there's a lot more humidity, they're more susceptible to fungal diseases. Doesn't mean they can't get something. And every spring, my roses get aphids and thrips. I just deal with them basically. But roses um, can flower most of the summer, really. Now, what usually happens is they'll start getting going in April. And in May, the flowers just come bursting forward. Uh, maybe May and June, and then they, you know, you cut them back and they'll have kind of a quiet period, which is a good time to feed them in between. And then once it starts raining, they'll begin growing again. Now, the time of year to prune roses is in March. So if we've grown roses somewhere else, there may be a different schedule, but you don't want um, to do it too early. Uh, some places, everybody says, well, I always prune my roses in, in autumn when I live who knows where? I don't care. It does not it doesn't work here. I'm telling you, you should you know prune them in March. If you notice, for example, um, at the uh, Charlotte Hall Museum, they have about 200 roses there. They're really great. And so every spring in March, the master gardeners descend there, and they'll have maybe 10 or 12 people cutting, and another 10 or 12 people hauling away all the canes, so everybody isn't stumbling on them. And then you have the garden superintendent who comes around and says, take more off that, take more off that. So you don't have to be shy about pruning mature roses. The more you do it, the more they're going to like it. They'll grow back. And I'm sure you all heard of deadheading, which means cutting off the dead flowers. A lot of times on days, I mean, I deadhead most of the time in between talking to customers. It's just a thing to do. So it's become a hobby. Then I go home and deadhead my roses. So, you know, I've gotten to be quite experienced in deadheading, but uh, roses are just a wonderful choice here. You don't have to mulch them in the wintertime. There were some folks here from Minnesota said, well, we used to put bales of hay around them. Okay, I felt, okay, before you go into a long story, just let me assure you, you don't need to do that here. Yeah, we'll get low temperatures, but you don't need to, you don't need to mulch them. My roses, and a lot of them, they, they keep their leaves until almost the end of the year. 
Um, and then they you know they'll drop them and they'll look kind of ragged. And then all of a sudden February comes along, they start to make you come back. So roses are really good. Yes, ma'am. Do we need to take all the leaves off the roses like we did in other places um, in the fall? No. So the question was, do you need to take the leaves off the roses? And the answer is really no, unless you see maybe some powdery mildew or something that you'd want to get rid of or some fungal problem. Otherwise, you don't have to defoliate them or anything. Um, the the weather will, in which weather will take care of a lot of that for you and the new growth will come and kind of push those all away. So, you know, as far as, you know, hygiene in the yard, typical thing is, you know, you get rid of all those leaves from last year because they could harbor and overwinter uh, powdery mildew, which is kind of a typical thing that happens here. Just get rid of that for the springtime. Uh, we, and we have fertilizers and sprays for roses. And so let me talk about that. So the question was, how do roses do in pots? And the answer is they do really well. The main thing is if you have a rose that's that size, I would make sure you have a pot that's about twice that big. So they may not get as tall as roses in the ground, but roses will do great in pots. Um, let me digress a little bit. So we have this all-purpose fertilizer. I put it on my roses. In fact, I put it on everything in the yard. This is why I think this is so great. This is a slow release organic fertilizer. It's mostly cottonseed meal and bird droppings. There's nothing chemical about it. If you spill it, it's not going to burn the grass. If your dog sniffs and licks it a little bit, it's okay. Just don't let them feed at the bag because you know how dogs are. They could eat the rest of the bag, then they might get sick. But this is uh, three, four times a year. This is good. And the way I do this is I just go around and toss it around the, pran the branches the trunks of all the trees. I do the entire yard. If you want to be more precise, there are instructions on how many ounces per tree thickness. My idea is I don't feel like doing math in my garage. I want to fertilize. And and then because, you know, I have a lot of trees, they get, I give them a fair amount of fertilizer. And then I go in and I water them down afterwards. This is a light, fluffy product. You don't want it to blow away after you put it on the ground. Three times a year. And one of the times happens to be the 4th of July. And you know, we just pick out those dates as, you know, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, to help us remember the time of year. But it's also good um, because now we're starting to get rain. So if you look in the forecast, it's going to rain this afternoon. You could fertilize in the morning. I would still wet it down because you know how sometimes a wind will precede a storm. Wet it down just so it's wet and doesn't blow away. And then if it's a slow rain, water is in, you'd be in great shape. So, so it's a seasonal kind of thing, uh, and it's great for roses, for anything in the yard. And this is down below if you're interested. So if you, if you use that and you use the flower power, power mm -hmm. can you use both at the same time? Yes. yes. So the question is about how you might mix and match our fertilizer. So let's talk a little bit about that. This all-purpose fertilizer plant food is consider it sort of like the meat and potatoes of our fertilizer. You just do it about three times a year. She asked about flower power. Flower power is a product that's intended to just push flowers. It's there to increase bloom. It has a lot of nitrogen in it. You can use that every two weeks if you want to. It's easy to use. There's even a little scoop in the container. You scoop it out, put it in a watering can, water the ground. Flowers will come coming back. My annuals that are growing on my deck, I give them flower power about every two weeks. Um, so flower power is good. So you can do this, do this regular fertilizer, wait a couple weeks, do flower power, and then repeat flower power all summer if you want to. Um, we also have this other product called Root and Grow. And this is also uh, a good fertilizer when planting. It helps with um, transplant shock. It helps to stimulate root growth. I have some of this and I put it on new plants or plants that are that look maybe like they're a little bit stressed, you know, like they got under a snow drift or, uh, you know, the, the wind kind of broke a couple branches. And I use this on my house plants as well. But when I mix up the can, um, I will mix, it, mix up the water. I always make sure I have a little rag with me because this stuff is strong, brown, thick very fertile. So it's like a composted tea. 
so you just don't want to spill it in the house. But this is good stuff. So this one, flower power. I don't think I brought any flower power, but we have it. And then this root and grow. So you can use all of those in whatever combination you like. Last class, somebody said they use flower power in their vegetable garden. This was somebody that was on Facebook, and they called in their recommendation. Um, so do you have any other questions? I'm going to talk about, show you some other plants. Yes, ma'am? I'm, I'm looking at the, that succulent, the one the, that, that you talked about. Yes. And how much longer is it going to be in bloom? Like, if I buy it today and put, put it out... Mm -hmm. How long will that is it going to last till November? Did you say? I yeah, didn't yeah. Catch it. So the question was about portulaca, yes, which portulaca. is the portulaca, which is the succulent with all the flowers. And if you were to buy it today, put it in a pot in your house outside, how long is it going to go? I would say probably uh, late October. Okay. Uh, really, until we have you know a freeze, and the the average is October 29th is the 100 year average of when we get a frost. So probably until we get frost and cold weather for several nights in a row, which usually will take you through October. Yeah. I mean, you know, we could have a cold spell before that, but it's not really very typical. Okay, so any other questions before I go on to the next? Yes, ma'am. You said several times cover plants. What do you cover them with? Cheesecloth. We, well... The question was, what do you cover plants with? I mean, some people just take a corrugated box and cover it up. Depends on how permanent you want this to be. Uh, some people put pillowcases. My neighbor put a pillowcase over her bougainvillea, which I thought was kind of unattractive. All winter long, you look at a pillowcase. In the summer, you get a bougainvillea. And it's like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. It's pretty, and then it's ugly. But we have this product. It's, uh, I think it's kind of cheesecloth, and it comes in big sheets. And um, so you can use that. But if you don't have that, you know, old sheets will work. And we're assuming that for covering, this is not something that you're going, you want for every, all the time, right? It's for a couple of cold nights. Yes, ma'am. Well, my front yard is not uh, uh, safe. Uh, safe. Uh, it's not safe for anything except, you know, a walk through it or. But I have a lot of happily in that deer. I had a bear at the door. Oh. Time. I live in the mountains. And the only thing that grows that nobody will eat is ginseng wheat. So it's hard to find here, up here. Yeah. Local wheat. Good luck. I mean, and that's not even something that we have. So it's kind of something wild. So the, the comment, the question was about this lady lives up in the mountains. She has deer javelina. She had a bear at the front door. Um, what do you put in your yard that's going to be safe? And the answer may be, that's a, that's a difficult question. But let me show you one thing. I believe that if you consider sage, lavender, and rosemary, those are usually pretty good bets. That they see, and this, this is autumn sage, it's in the salvia family. It's always on the list. Animals do not like it. You know why? Because it's so strong. All you gotta do is rough this up and you get that sage smell. Um, hummingbirds love this, but usually animals don't. However, we have these lists of less likely to eat. It's, there are no guarantees. We don't call it a javelina proof plant because there's really no such thing. Because if they're really hungry, they'll eat things they would normally pass up and they don't really like them. Um, but usually, I mean, you know, I had the 15 javelinas in my yard last, you know, this week. And they left these alone. I have several sage. And so uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, this is less likely to eat, but no guarantees. You know? I ride around in the mountain area or walk around in the mountain area, and every time I see some, some pods or chips and weed, mm -hmm. I pick them and I them where I plant them. Yeah, yeah. So as you know, I mean, these animals are they're pretty ubiquitous. A friend of mine was taking his dog up to Thumb Butte for a walk. He looked away, all of a sudden, there was a deer right in front of the car, and he hit a deer, slammed on the brakes. The dog came flying up, hit the windshield. Um, car was not damaged too badly, and he went to look at the deer, and it was kind of struggling and bleeding. He tried to pick it up, maybe to get it off the road, and it jumped up and ran away. 
Um, but, you know, if you run into a, any animal at more than about 15 miles an hour, you could have major damage to your car and you could kill an animal. But what are you going to do? I've driven up with him. One time we drove up that same road up to Thumb Butte, taking the dog out. First of all, five javelina across the street. We round the bend, three deer across the street. Finally, I said, I think I'm going to slow down to about 15. This is kind of a windy road, but you never know what can happen. You know, you don't want a collision with an animal because it's not good for anybody, basically. But full sun. Full sun, yes. So autumn sage. And this also comes in multiple colors. We have pink and red. Um, really good plant. And the uh, hummingbirds will come in and feed. So they're really nice. Pardon me? Can't take the winter, though, right? Well, it can't will. Can't take the cold or winter. It, it'll handle the cold. The question is, okay, so about this autumn, autumn sage, it is a perennial. So what happens in the wintertime is all the leaves and the flowers are gone and you have these thin branches. But the plant is dormant. So that's a good time to prune it because you can, I like to keep mine sort of in a shrubby shape. If you don't, after several years, they can sort of get these leggy branches growing out. But so if you keep it grown back, it'll come back in the spring. It's just dormant in the winter. Oh, okay. So it's, like it's what we call a uh, deciduous plant. So it's loses it leaves, then comes back. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about lavender and the types of lavender that Yes. So we have a question uh, requested to talk about lavender. Lavender is also a good plant that usually these animals don't like. It's herbal, right? And it does well here. The one cautionary note about lavender is it's easy to overwater it. Um, so how much that is, you have to be the judge of it. But if it looks like it's wilting, don't water it more because chances are the problem is too much water already. So lavender is, and, and lavender is almost like a, a perennial. I mean, it is a perennial, but it's almost like an evergreen in that it hangs on to some of its greenery. The flowers may go away and you can cut those back. But a lot of times what's left is that little mass that's still there. So it's a great choice. It will do well here. And we, we, see, we have some right over there as well as the rosemary. And rosemary is evergreen and also a plant that animals don't like because, again, because of the strong taste. But those will grow all year and as well, the lavender. And I think we have, you know, Spanish lavender and we have the French Provence lavender and all different kinds. Not sure what the latest is right now, but they're right over there. Sorry. Um, Pardon me? Yes, uh -huh. bees like it. And you know, one thing about bees, if you have flowers, as you know, you're going to have bees. And people come in and they say, well, I, you know, I want a plant with a lot of flowers and no bees. It doesn't exist, right? I mean, they go together. But the thing about, and I understand people are concerned, they're allergic to bees, maybe they've been stung before. But usually, when bees are pollinating, they are not going to bother you if you don't bother them. They're so busy working, they don't care about you. They're not nasty like yellow jackets. I mean, uh, they just are hardworking bees, and we should let them be, but really not worry about them. Uh, I mean, I had, uh, from time to time, I have problems with um, yellow jackets. I don't like them. As a kid, my, one of my hobbies was going after nests and throwing rocks at them, so that's kind of ingrained in me. When I moved into a house here many years ago, I was walking around the backyard, and all of a sudden, uh, I, found, I got stung on the bottom of my foot because I was wearing flip-flops by a yellow jacket. So I thought, oh, I stepped on a thorn. Oh, it started throbbing. Oh, no, this is more than a thorn. And then I turned around, and there's a hole in the ground, and a yellow jacket stuff. So I got the bait. In the old days, when I was growing up, I would get that foam and just spray it down there and kill them and stomp on them, you know, just because, you know, it's like a kid thing to do, right? I grew up in Maryland. In the summertime, hornets, wasps, yellow jackets, they're all over the place. So we had plenty of opportunities. I've been stung many times, believe me. <laughs> um, so anyway, here's something else. Since we're... We're talking about bugs. Now that it started raining, guess what is out in force? Mosquitoes. As soon as it starts raining, those eggs hatch. And um, my wife and I go out on our deck at night, sit down in the wicker chair, and try to be comfortable. And all of a sudden, all the mosquitoes come over to her, not me. So, you know, there's all kinds of candles and, you know, electronic things and so on. I'd say, Get as many things as you can, because I think they need to work together. But this is um, a scented geranium. 
uh, and it has sort of a citronella type smell. I mean, I can smell it right here. So usually what I'll do is when we go outside, you can sprinkle this with water or you can just fluff it up and, you know, like rub it on your skin or your clothes and it helps keep the bugs away. These have little flowers, but that's not their main thing in life. The main thing is to sort of give off this citronella smell and discourage um, mosquitoes and other bugs like that. And they grow like crazy. They get to be huge. By the end of the season, plant like this, I started out with a small one like this, it'll probably be four times this size. And I'm kind of sad to see it go at the end of the year because it's done a good job and it's grown like crazy and you have to water it almost every day. So whatever, I guess it takes a lot of water to produce that citronella smell. So this has some function. How about this? I don't know about your yard, but this is yarrow. This is also a plant that deer and rabbit are not supposed to like. I have to admit that rabbit ate one of these. Of course, when you have young plants, those are the most vulnerable, right? Because they got tender shoots, they got new leaves. Um, these are new plants are one of the things that you need to look after and try and protect until they get to be mature. But this is a nice native plant, fills in, doesn't get too tall. Yarrow, we also have it in, in some red and orange colors. It's a great uh, native plant that should do well in your yard without too much maintenance. Full sun, yeah. So full sun for everything I've mentioned here, except, except for, this is called coral bells or ukura. And you see these beautiful, delicate flowers? This is what they do. These can get to be pretty tall. We had some down there that were way up here, but they were kind of wilting, so I got this up here to show you. And the thing that's nice is some uh, they, these come in multiple colors. Some people say, I don't like that color. Okay, well, there's about four other shades of this. There's burgundy. There's a sort of a mint green, and you could mix and match. These love to grow in the shade. They are not sun-loving plants, and also you don't need to water them too much. So those are, you know, good things because after all, we're trying to ration the water that we have. Um, and you could, under a tree or in a shady area, you could mix and match and put four or five different colors. There's a lime green one that uh, I was showing a lady a while ago, and she said, if I grew that in my yard, my grandchildren would pick the leaves and try and put them in the lettuce bowl. So, but... Um, <laughs> This is a really nice shade-loving plant with a whole lot of variations on a theme. One hour? One hour has gone by already. <laughs> so we're having so much fun here, right? So, <laughs> Okay, so let's just make sure we talk, talked about climate. We talked about soil, animals, and insects. Um, you can expect that Whatever you have growing in your yard, if it has flowers, it may have aphids, thrips, whatever. Uh, we also have trees here. I didn't bring up any trees today, but we have, uh, you can see a lot of evergreen trees here, blue spruces. Uh, we have deciduous trees, maples, um, ash trees, lots of trees that are ornamental pears that are great shade trees. Um, happy to show you any of those if you're interested. I was focusing mostly on some plants that were kind of easy to bring up here and take a look at. Um, one of the... Here's one of my favorites. This is a crepe myrtle. Now, um, they don't get really very big here and they don't get going until the weather's hot. But look at these flowers, aren't these great? I have a dark red one of these, I've got a pink one and they're flowering so much that people walking down the street will stop and ask me what that is. I'll say, oh, it's just my crepe myrtle, you know? Um, so these are really nice. You go to other parts of the country and they're trees. And here they're more like shrubs. Will they do okay in pots? Yes, they will do okay in pots. Crepe myrtles will do okay in pots. Just you have to be patient with them. You know, in the springtime, get them out there with the maximum sun. They won't do much until that. So it looks like our time is up today. Um, any other questions? Uh, and we can, if you want, I'll stick around if you have questions afterwards as well. Yes, ma'am. Sure. So the question is, uh, it can, is there anything that will grow in the shade of an alligator juniper? Yes. 
and we have a lot of shade plants and that coral bells that loves the shade and and so and if the soil is a little acidic that's great our soil is kind of salty and alkaline uh, we do whatever we can to amend the soil so it's more acidic do you have any climbers that um like for a wall that are acidic? yes we do so the question is do we have climbers we have down that way we have a binding section we have climbing roses we have honeysuckle um, virginia creeper uh, we're trying to get some more pyracantha they're, they're green all year. some of them are i can show you not all vines are evergreen some are and some are not you have to look at each plant individually so yes ma'am We didn't, thank you for reminding me. Okay. This is a butterfly bush, another plant that does really well here. And we have, um, you know, small ones to large ones. They flower almost all summer and even hang on to their leaves a lot of the winter. So it's kind of described as a semi evergreen. So it's a great plant and we have a bunch of them here. If you like, I can, I can show you some of them. It looks like we need to wrap things up, right? And maybe we can just do questions afterwards. I'll just, I'll cut off the live stream and you can keep going as long as you want. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Um, no. So the question is about water.